We've opened up to the book of Joshua, chapter one. We've been in this book for five weeks. And the reason we're doing this as a church is because we've identified a season of transition that is going towards not just transitioning from an old work towards a new work that God wants to do in our church and in our city, and so many of you have come as part of a new thing that God is doing in your life. And you're part of a church that God has sovereignly placed you into because he's kind of shifting us from the way that he has worked in the past towards what he wants to do now. And the reason we study Joshua and what we've looked at the last four weeks is this biblical example of how God has taken one work from one generation, continued it to the next one. So Joshua is where the work from the generation of Moses has been transferred into the leadership in the generation that Joshua will take to continue the work of God, to take his people out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land. And last week we looked, about, we looked at this one verse, Joshua chapter 1, verse 16, as this thing that we see as an example of the people as to why they were a generation that saw God's work fulfilled. Joshua has now heard from the Lord that Moses is dead. It is now his calling to lead the people from the wilderness into the promised land. He's been given a clear instruction on how that's supposed to look from his time with the Lord. And now we are looking at this section where he has taken the instruction to the people. Moses is dead. Within three days now, get ready and make your provisions because we are going to go from the wilderness into the promise. And Joshua chapter 1 verse 16 is the response of all of these people that are now being asked to go to pick up the stakes, to pack their bags, and to walk towards, by faith, the promises of God. Last week, we looked at their example as one of the key aspects for any movement of God to be successful. There's got to be willing people. There's got to be people who actually have faith in the commandments of God and the movement of God that it will work and it's worth their life. That's what Joshua chapter 116 shows us. It says, so they answered Joshua saying, all that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. This is the response of anyone who has ever experienced a movement of God in their lives. When the word of the Lord comes into your life, when the Lord speaks to you and calls you, are you willing to say, send me wherever you want me to go? I'll do whatever you want me to do. The reason we look at this again, the reason we're not done with this particular statement is because it comes with one extra commitment that they want to be really clear about. What does it mean now for them to tell Joshua, send us and we'll go, tell us and we'll do? It comes with something. It comes with what they are laying out to Joshua is what I'll call a spiritual non-negotiable. This is something that they're agreeing to as long as Joshua and this movement has a certain thing tied to it. And we all have non-negotiables in our lives. Whether you know it or not, you are living inside relationships and contracts with your job or your school that comes with this thing that represents how far you would go. What you would actually be willing to do, and you have this boundary that is set up by your non-negotiable, and when that's broken, it's over. This reminds me of a story uh, about my younger sister. In fact, is she here this morning? Has anyone seen Bethany? No? Okay, good. I want to tell a story about her. <laughs> so on the day of my uh, sister's wedding, her husband sat her down and said this, we're about to commit our lives to each other, about to exchange vows that end with till death do, death do us part. Before we do that, I want to lay out one non-negotiable that I am bringing into this relationship. And this is something I will not budge on. And I need to know you're down before we move forward. And so she sat down and she said, what is it? And he said, you are marrying a man with a glorious beard and he will never shave it. <laughs> Don't ever ask me. You'll never see what's underneath this beard. And she said, okay. And they got married. And to this day, as far as I know, unverified by this morning's interaction with my sister and my brother-in-law, but he still has that beard. That's still part of the relationship that is intact. Now, every relationship has something that represents the uniqueness of that relationship that says, this is how far we'll go. Don't ask me to go a minute farther than this. And in your life, with God and with church and the movement of God in your life, there is something that all of us have to say, I'll do whatever. I'll go wherever except this. And what we're going to study this morning is when these people respond with their non-negotiable. We want to look at that. Because they're going to be an example of 
in actuality, a very good example of a boundary. It has to have this if we're going to go. And before I look at this, I want to remind you that there are non-negotiables, there are boundaries, there are filters by which we agree to go or not go that are sometimes not the non-negotiable that is a healthy movement of God that should be used as a metric as to whether or not you should be in something. There's a lot of versions of that even now. And that's one of the challenges of the church age that we have been sovereignly by the grace of God placed into to take part in is that we have all sorts of different reasons to stop to not continue with the people that God has brought into our lives, to not continue in the movement of God in a particular church. And there's all sorts of ways that people decide that uh, I'm no longer going to be a part of this, or maybe I'm not supposed to be a part of it. There's some bad non-negotiable sometimes. Uh, sometimes it's if the sermon really speaks, if there's a guy who can really activate me, really come alive, then, then I'll go. And as soon as that kind of fades off, which it will, by the way, if it hasn't already, for those of you checking your email, and then you're like, that's as far as I can go now. Uh, the songs have to be really exciting. The organizational flow of a church has to be a certain way so that exactly the flow that you're into, and then you, you hit a certain wall and you say, this might be my time to leave. Now, let me say and, and caution you, if a non-negotiable has to do with one of the details of the group that you're a part of, um, this church, in fact, is under construction, like in fact it is. I'm so glad that we have caution tape on our windows out here. And as I see that, I see it's good to have that so that OSHA is happy with the way that we're dealing with our construction zone. But it's also good as just a reminder of this church. This church is always under construction. There's always something that God's going to do to rebuild or prune a little bit or build, bring something in and pray for laborers here, send people there. This, can, this church is, has been, in, in my leading of it, a process of finding the right construction to take part in and trust God in. But let me tell you something else. Every church is under construction. Every single one of them. And there's times where you might stub your toe on the construction zone of this church, and you might think, well, here's the problem. What I need to do is to go find that zone where it's construction-free. And you might find a version of church that's construction-free for a time. And then all of a sudden, they're going to put up those orange cones outside of your street and your version of ministry, your version of interacting with that street. And then the speed limit's going to go down a little bit. And then your commute to your version of church is going to slow down a little bit, and you've got a decision to make. Are you willing to keep going, or have you met your non-negotiable? And that's just one example. We have to deal with this with relationships. We have to deal with this with where God has placed us in the city, in the place that we work, and all of the ways that we're wanting to be led by God, living out faith, and trying to figure out, are we still supposed to keep going? Because of time, I'll share two non-negotiables that come up in this version of transition and following the movement of God that I think are healthy and I think they're wise. These are just two. The first thing, we go from verse 16 now to verse 17. It says this, we are with you wherever you send us and whatever you command us to do. Just as we heeded Moses or allowed Moses to lead us in all things, we will heed you only. And this is the word of the hour. Only is the version of saying, as long as, only if, here's my thing that always has to be a part of this equation, only the Lord your God be with you. That is part of the healthy non-negotiable of what it means to follow the movement of God for a church and for a family and for an individual. Here's a simple understanding of anything that I'm going to share now is to expound upon this point. You know what you need to measure everything in your life by? Whether or not you should be in it, whether or not you should keep going, whether or not it's for you. It's not the difficulties of seasons. Those will come and go. It's not how comfortable something is. Comfort will come and go. It's not how uplifting and exciting it is. All of that wanes. What your non-negotiable is, if you want to be someone who lives by faith to be part of a movement of God, is God actually in it? Is God actually part of why you're doing what you're doing? Is God the reason that we're here this morning? Is because we want to seek him, to know him, to understand how he is moving. And this is a healthy and wise version of a non-negotiable. The second one is given in the end of verse 18. Only be strong and of good courage. These are the two for the morning. 
you want to live by faith and you want to be part of what God has planned for you to receive the promises for your life, to be part of a church that's walking in the promises and the joy and satisfaction of God, two non-negotiables. One, God has to be in everything that you do. God has to be with you in everything that you do. And the other thing, and a mark of that being true of your life, non-negotiable number two, your life must be marked by courage and boldness and strength. And the reason those are attached to each other because you can't separate them. If you are really with God, you'll be someone who is marked by courage. And if you want to be strong in the faith, if you want to be someone who steps out into faith to see God move, you've got to be with God. And you can't have one with the other. So the question of the hour now that we should be asking is, well, what does that actually mean and look like? How do I know if I'm with God? How do I know if I'm in the will of God, in the perfect commandments of God, on the path that God has for my life that truly does lead to joy? And we'll use the rest of the time that we have in scriptures this morning to answer that question because there are hints and previews of the answer right here. They say, we'll be with you, non-negotiable, only if you have God on your side, that God is with you just as he was with Moses. So there is actually now a concrete way for them to see the leadership of Joshua, the way that he is leading them towards the promises of God, as a way to say, does it look like it did when Moses was leading us? Because we know he was with God. So, students of history, how was God with Moses? Exodus chapter 3 now. Let's turn there. As you're turning to Exodus chapter 3, allow me to set the table of the context of this. The generational work from Moses to Joshua had a genesis as well. Moses was a shepherd, living in Midian, tending the flocks of his father-in-law. And the word of the Lord comes to him in a story you may have heard of, in, the, in, in, a, in, a, in a consuming fire that does not eat away at this one bush, and the presence of the Lord comes in this fire to speak to Moses and give him his marching orders. Listen to what he says. Verse 7 of, Moses, or of Exodus chapter 3. And the Lord said, I have sh- sh- surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Here's answer number one, how God was with Moses. God comes into Moses' life according to his mercy, his compassion for a cry that he heard for his people. You want to know where God is in your life and where he is leading you and guiding you, allow him to respond to the question. Are you crying out to him? Is this a burden of your life that, is, that you're being called into a relationship with God enough to ask him and to cry out to him with the struggles and pains of your life? Because the, the movement of generational work of Moses started by God responding to the cry of his people and then coming in to use Moses as an instrument of his desire to redeem his people. God wants to give you an answer. Are you someone that's seeking an answer for your life? Are you someone who is opening your heart to God being the possibility of an answer to some of the questions of your life, to some of the hurt of your life, to some of the pain of your life? It begins with a cry. And then he speaks to Moses and says this, verse 8. I know their sorrows, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to good and large land, to land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites. When we study the book of Joshua and the mission of God continuing now, even though Moses, the leader, is dead, we're studying the history of God's promises that are found all throughout Scripture. And so often when we think about the mission of Joshua to lead these people into the promised land, what we're really doing is remembering that God is still faithful because that is a promise that is older than Joshua, older than Moses. It goes all the way into the beginning of God's work with humanity when he reached into the life of Abraham. So God is faithful. And because he's faithful, he is going to use Moses to redeem his people. Verse 10, come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. He's got the call on his life. He's going to go from shepherd of sheep to shepherd of people. He's going to become God's mouthpiece of deliverance and redemption. 
and you get the call on your life, or you wait for the call on your life, do you ever feel the burden of saying, really? You want me to do what? You want me to minister to who? You want to use me in the way that I can't see myself being used? Oftentimes, when you begin to ask the question, God, are you with me? What you're doing is you're opening up your life into seeing all of the ways that God would need to be with you, that God would need to strengthen you, that God would need to provide for you. And this is exactly what has come into this conversation with Moses. Verse 10, or verse 11, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now, here's how God was with Moses. Here's an example of us figuring out how God is with people. Verse 12, he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this very mountain. Here's what God does. He says, I want you to step out in faith and I want you to believe me. And as you do that, I will begin to show you signs of my faithfulness. You want to know that God is faithful. You've got to allow him to show himself faithful. He said, I'm going to give you a sign that when you get out of Egypt, we're going to come right back here and we'll meet again. And that's exactly what happens. And there will be signs all along the way. As Moses steps out in faith, he experiences the faithfulness of God. Because he goes to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh doesn't believe Moses is from God. Pharaoh doesn't believe that it's God's will to let these people go. He doesn't care. So what has to happen? He has to see the signs of the power of God in ten plagues. And it's only after the tenth sign that it is truly God who is redeeming these people that he lets them go. And the soldiers of Pharaoh's army, when there's doubt and arising of if God is with these people or not, and Pharaoh sends his army to go back and get them, the Lord gives everyone another sign to show them who he is with. The waters part. They walk across on dry land, and the, the, the waters then consume the armies of Pharaoh. Take it as a sign of who God is with. And when they get hungry in the desert, he provides manna from heaven as a sign of his faithfulness. And when they get thirsty, he provides water from a rock as a sign of his faithfulness. And this is the life that you are being called to live if you really want to know if God is with you. Then you need to start gathering all of the ways that you have become a witness to the faithfulness of God. This is not a message for Moses to know that God is with him. This is a message for all of us to know that God is with us. And the message will expand now. If you just turn over to Exodus chapter 6, this God who delivers his faithfulness in pictures and signs of provision is now going to open that invitation up to anyone in the nation of Israel. It says in, in Exodus chapter 6, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I'm the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, as God Almighty, but my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. I have heard the groaning of the children of Israel, and the Egyptians keep them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, let them know. Say to the children of Israel, I'm the Lord. I will bring you out, under, out from under bondage of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with outstretched arms and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Now watch me work. And so what has to happen? By faith, they need to see this God who promised to redeem them, do it. And by faith, they need to know this God who said he'd be with them, do it. And this is the same model for all of us to live out the faith that knows that God is with us. In what way are you seeing the faithfulness of God show you signs of his goodness? In what way are you living a life that allows God to continually deliver you? For some of you, God wants to show himself strong, show that he is in fact with you and drawing you to a relationship with himself by delivering you from bondage, by coming into your life and breaking the chains of the sin and fallen nature of this world and to show you that he's capable of doing that. And we are all messengers of that power of God to redeem people from not just slavery but sin. 
There are some of you who are burdened and heavy laden. And the word says, come to me and I will give you rest. And when he gives you rest, when he lifts your burdens, take it as a sign that he is with you. There are some of you who worry and have anxiety. And the scripture says that you take all of those things through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will consume your life. And when you experience that peace, take it as a sign that God is with you. In what way do you have an experiential life and relationship with this God who is with us? That's one of the ways that we answer the question practically. Let me share with you one example of someone that I really believe was doing this. And I, I want to do a better job at sharing the amazing stories of people who have been used throughout the history of God on the mission field because I believe that part of the way that God is stirring us to know how he's with us is by shaking up the, the church that we belong to and sending some of us to the distant mission field. So some of you maybe need to listen to this closer. This is a man named George Mueller. It says of, of George Mueller... He was a Christian missionary in the years 1805 to 1898, an evangelist and a coordinator of an orphanage in Bristol, England. Through his faith and prayers alone, without ever asking for money or being part of a specific program, he had the pr privilege of caring for over 120,000 orphans. A ministry that was built on faith and prayer alone. And this is what he said after years of serving the Lord, living out faith, going to 42 different countries to be a missionary on a ship, bringing the gospel as an evangelist. He would write it all down and say this. In his journals, Mueller recorded miracle after miracle of God's provisions and answered prayers to show him the faithfulness of God. Do you want to know that God is with you? You need to live so close to the edge of your life in faith that God has to provide for you. And when he provides, and when he does something to take care of you, to bring you closer and closer to the joy and the satisfaction and the abundant life that he has for every one of us, they're sign markers. And you look back and you say, yes, God was with me here. And God was with me here. And God was with me here. And that is exactly what we're studying this morning. We will be with you as long as God is with you like he was with Moses, from faithfulness to faithfulness to faithfulness to faithfulness. Number two, equally as important. When we study the book of Joshua as an example of people who are living by faith, I'll go anywhere and I'll do anything as long as God is with you, as long as God is in it. They're strengthened by God's faithfulness, but you know how else they're strengthened? They're strengthened by being part of a movement that was broad amongst all of God's people. They're strengthened by the, the reality that God chose Joshua to be a leader, and then he gave the ability of Joshua to cast vision in such a way that they were all in it together, that they're all beginning to be stirred up for this mission that will not be easy. They're going to pick up the stakes, pack the bags, arm themselves, and they are willing to go because part of God being with us is God raising up laborers to be part of the movement together. And we miss this quite a bit. We miss this part of the way that we want to feel God active and alive in our lives. We see the need for his faithfulness to be on display. But so often in our version of seeking, it becomes very individual. We want to know our own theology. We want to have our own experiential salvation experience. We want to have our own growth track. And so that we come in these big crowds, and some of the, the, the crowd that exists is here just because it's so easy to receive alone and do it alone. But that's not always the way God shows us his faithfulness. Much of the faithfulness of God is seen through the faithfulness of God's people helping one another. The people with Joshua said, we're in. If God's in, we are here to help. And it says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 18, they said, if anyone rebels, we will put them to death. They were ready to fight the cause that God was in. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to be people who allow God to strengthen us with individual answer of prayer and faithfulness for our lives, but also by bringing people into our lives that represent the gifts of God for each other. Let's use Moses as an example again for this. If you turn just a little bit farther in Exodus chapter 6, 
and go down to verse 9. Exodus 6, we've read, it's God saying, for the children of Israel, I'm going to do all of these things to redeem them and provide for them and be their God, and then they'll know. And Moses, you're going to tell them all those things. And listen to what Moses says now. Uh, again, we're going to see Moses, as he's toying with or being tempted by the wrong non-negotiable. The first one was, is it really me? Should I stop now? Because I don't feel equipped. God says, I'll be with you. Now in verse 9, it says, Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they didn't listen to Moses because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage, because they were oppressed, because they were still part of this system that was not able to let them live free. They couldn't even hear the vision that Moses had that God was going to redeem these people. So what does the Lord do to encourage Moses? He says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, go and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to the children of Israel, to, go, to let them go out of this land. And Moses has a very good objection here. Moses is like, are you sure you've got the wrong, right guy? Just based off the evidence here, let me explain what's happening. Moses spoke before the Lord saying, the children of Israel didn't listen to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am un, of uncircumcised lips. I don't speak well. It's obvious I don't lead well because the people that I'm trying to lead, they don't even listen to me. And now, instead of helping me figure out how to lead the people that you want me to be a part of redeeming for your name, now you're just telling me to go to the Pharaoh. Now you're telling me to actually go to the one in charge of all of these slaves and the most powerful nation in existence at this time. I don't think you got the right guy, Lord. I don't speak well, and I'm not having any success in this. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever wonder if that is a non-negotiable in your life? Do you ever wonder if that's a measurement of when you should maybe pump the brakes and not step out in faith? Listen to what the Lord does. This is really interesting. This took me a minute to see. It says in verse 13, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. That's all that happens. In, in, in verse 9 it says that the Lord spoke to Moses saying this is what you need to do. Moses is like, it's not working. So then the Lord just says, okay, I'm going to, spoke to speak to you again, and I'm also going to speak to Aaron. I'm bringing someone in on this mission. I'm going to continue you towards being my mouthpiece, but I'm going to bring someone alongside you in Aaron to help you. And that's exactly what happens. Moses is strengthened by God's faithfulness time and time again, and so often it comes in the form of someone God brought into his life to be part of the mission with him to be part of the, the task of doing something that is beyond his skill set or his comfort zone or his past success. God wants to bring people into your life to remind you that he cares about you, to remind you that he's called you to do something and it might not be that you're supposed to do it alone. And because I love George Mueller so much, I'm going to share a specific story of how he's another example of this. The first George Mueller quote I read, it said that he had all these journals of the faithfulness of God. And the faithfulness of God was how he was able to live out the faith in God that he had. Listen to one of the specific entries now. It says this. One morning, all the plates and cups and bowls on the table were empty. There was no food in the pantry and no money to buy food. The children were standing waiting for their morning meal. When Mueller said, children, you know we must be in time for school. Then lifting up his hands, he prayed, Dear Father, we thank you for what you are going to give us to eat. Okay, let me set the stage there. He's overseeing an orphanage that is built on nothing but a prayer and faith in God. On one particular morning, it's all the children are in the mess hall ready to eat, and it's almost time for school. And so he says, well, we can't be late. Let's pray for the meal that he doesn't have. Let's pray for the food that's not in the pantry. Let's thank God in advance for how he is going to provide because we believe that he's with us. And so how does God provide? Is it manna from heaven? No. It's the second model. God provides by using God's people to encourage those who need the encouragement of God. And this is what happens now. It says, just then, there was a knock at the door. The baker stood there and said, Mr. Mueller, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt you didn't have bread for breakfast and the Lord wanted me to send you some. So I got up at 2 a.m. and I baked some fresh bread and I have brought it. You better open the door when somebody knocks on your life. 
You better, if you're asking if God is with you, if you really want to know if God is on your side and there's someone that God has brought into your life to help you, you better open the door. And that is how you will see the strengthening of God's people. And the other part of this, God will stir you at 2 a.m. for somebody else. God loves those of us who need some encouragement so much that he took some sleep from some of the other ones. He said, you wake up. I got a mission for you right now in the middle of the night. I need you to be an encouragement to someone else. And those are the two groups that we all are a part of. These are not two separate groups. Every single one of us have moments when God's knocking on our door in the form of somebody that he sent to help us. Will you open your heart? Will you open your life? Will you humble yourself and be helped by God's people? And there's other times in our life when you can't sleep at 2 a.m. And I want you to know that Sometimes God stirs our hearts and he changes our plans and he messes with our life so that we can be a help to others. And just because I love George Mueller so much, I'm going to read one more thing because this story isn't done. Right now, all we've got is bread for these kids, but God is a giving God. He doesn't just give these kids bread. He's going to give them something to wash it down. And this is how the story continues. Just as Mr. Mueller thanked the baker, no sooner had he left when there was a second knock at the door, it was the milkman. He announced that his milk cart had broken down right in front of his orphanage and he would like to give the children his cans of fresh milk so he could empty his wagon and repair it. Sometimes God will break you down to use you. Sometimes God loves his people so much that he will take people on a detour of life to send help your way. And this is what we're missing so often in the church age. We're all the milkmen and we're all the bakers and we all got stuff that we want to do with our lives and none of us are willing to stop and say, maybe church just isn't for a sermon. Maybe we're here to actually help one another. Maybe some of us need to be encouraged specifically by the word, specifically by this sermon. But maybe there's some of us who need that extra special attention that God has brought someone into your life today. That God has put you in a part of a community in this church because God wants his people to succeed in his calling and he does it by bringing us together. Can we open our lives to that? Can we open our hearts to each other? Can we break free from this system of running into church to hear the sermon and then running back to our individual life? God will strengthen you with his faithfulness and he strengthens you with his people. You're here for a reason. You're not here simply to hear a sermon. You're not here simply to get uplifted. You are here to be used by God. You are here to take this little version of encouragement that we get to take part in faithfully every Sunday through worship and, and, and a sermon. You're here to multiply it. You're here to be someone that God can use to encourage. You're here to be encouraged. So what does that look like in our lives? The other non-negotiable. The other non-negotiable for every one of us. you got to know that God is in it. You got to live on his faithfulness. You got to seek him in prayer. It starts with a cry. And then you got to be someone that God can use to strengthen his people, to strengthen his church, to strengthen a neighborhood that's crying out in oppression, to strengthen a workplace that needs the power of God's spirit and the hope of his glory, to strengthen a family. And you're the only one who believes. You're the only one who knows. God wants to use you to strengthen new people that he's bringing into this work. Second, non-negotiable, are you bold and courageous? That's a good one. Because you know these people, the George Muellers and the Joshuas, and the people who have gone before us to get us this far into the mission of God by God's grace, they're marked by something. Churches can be marked by this. People can be marked by this. When you're really with God, when you really understand that the God of the universe who created everything with his words and breathe life into humanity and made you in his image to know him and to walk with him. That's what you were created for. And when you realize that that God who created heaven and earth is with you, you'll be marked with courage. You'll be marked with boldness. You'll be marked with this attitude that if God is for you, who could be against you and what could stop you? You'll be marked with this belief that the, the temporary afflictions, the light and momentary heavy stuff is going to be far outweighed by the glory that awaits all of God's people. Because here's the grand story of the gospel. God is so with us that he sent his son to be a part of the mission. And his son completed the mission of being completely with God in everything that he did. And he took all of the ways that we've failed that mission and he dealt with the punishment it's life or death. He dealt with the punishment on the cross. And he overcame. 
and the tomb is empty and he's alive and his spirit moves for anyone who believes in that message and now you are part of this God who is with his people and you're supposed to live it out. Experience it in everything that you do. You're supposed to be a bold and courageous bunch. You're supposed to have peace and joy in the middle of storms. You're supposed to have satisfaction that can't be bought. It can't be found in the pleasure-seeking ways of this world. Are you marked with courage? Are you willing to do something with your life in such a time as this to be used by God? The only way that can be actually played out in your life is if you are someone who is with God and he is with you in all that you do. And so we're going to take some time to think about that. There's one final example I want to share. Andrew, will you come up here? So Andrew, this by the sovereignty of God landed on this weekend. Andrew's stepping out in faith right now. Andrew is marked by boldness and courage right now, and Andrew is a sign of the faithfulness of God. I don't know, six months ago, seven months ago, I don't know the exact time. Two years ago? Andrew, uh, Andrew came in here, recovering alcoholic, just out of prison, on parole, and he came in here searching for answers, and he was hurting. I met him over there, and he was crying. And for whatever reason, your soul was unsettled, and, and he pulled out a gun. He didn't know what else to do. And uh, we're living by faith. We're trusting God, right? And he pulled out a gun, and, and the cops got called, and, and he went back to prison. But miraculously, God gave him grace, and he opened up his heart. And it, Andrew repented of all that. And a couple weeks ago, I saw him in the lobby, and I looked at him, and I thought, are we cool? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I'm here to say sorry. I'm here to repent, and I want to do it to the whole church. That's bold. That's courageous. That's living out a belief that if God is for him, who could be against him? And so he's going to say sorry, and he's going to be an example that God is faithful. He's protected our church. He's kept us where we're at. He's using these kind of stories to encourage us, not to scare us. And Andrew is an example of someone that some of you need to relate to, that first step of faith is hard. It's hard to be bold. It's hard to leave everything, pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Some of you need to do that. It's hard to say sorry. It's bold and courageous, but if God is for you, you can do it. It's hard to pick up the phone or send the text or the email. It's hard to meet with people that you've hurt. It's hard to get back together and be reconciled with people that you've been separated for. But thank you, Andrew, because you're going to be an example of bold and courageous action that hopefully we're all inspired to take part in. So say what you need to say, brother. Um, I'm Andrew. Uh, <clears throat> this is, I've never done this. This is crazy. But uh, um, part of my recovery is my step nine. Make my amends to people that I've hurt. And I've came to this church since I was a little kid with boogers coming out of my nose. And uh, I love this church, and I have to make things right. It, uh, apologize and give the church a wholehearted, sincere apology. And I ask for prayer from everybody that I can keep the strength to walk forward and make it in life and succeed. Let's pray for and thank you all. Thank you. Love it, brother. Praise the Lord. Let, let's pray for this guy, for all of us, because, you know, repentance is beautiful. It's refreshing that we repent, that we can be built up and refreshed, and it's, it takes courage and boldness, but it is always, on the other side of it, it's forgiveness and mercy and joy and yeah. celebration of heaven. So let's pray for Andrew. God, thank you so much, Lord. We pray for his example to be something that you would use in all of our hearts and minds as we would take that step of boldness to say, we're sorry. We ask for forgiveness. We love you, God, and we want to be made, we want you to make things right in our lives, Lord. So help us to take part in this ministry of reconciliation. We, we love this man, Lord. We're so grateful that you softened his heart while he was in jail. And you put forgiveness in his life. And you, you, you put him on a path of repentance. And we're thankful for the way that he's showing it to us now. Lord, let him know that there is no condemnation in Christ. That all is forgiven. And that he is a sinner saved by grace just like all of us. 
because of your glory and your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen.